Καλησπέρα σας. Σας ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ που είστε σήμερα εδώ μαζί μας. Η παρουσίαση που θα ακολουθήσει θα γίνει στα αγγλικά. Όσοι δεν έχετε προμηθευτεί και χρειάζεστε, μπορείτε να παραλάβετε τα μηχανήματα μετάφρασης. Θα μου επιτρέψετε να, να καλωσορίσω τον προσκεκλημένο μας στα αγγλικά. Είναι πολύ μεγάλη η χαρά και η τιμή. Matt Winkler. It is with great pleasure that I present you, Mark Wi Matt Winkler, uh, co-founder and editor-in-chief, emeritus of Bloomberg News, who honors us today. Matt will share with us his vast experience and insights on the future of journalism through his uh, presentation, very interesting presentation, uh, titled uh, Signals in the Noise and we will uh, also have uh, some time for your questions. So, Matt, thank you again for being here with us today. And uh, with no further ado, the stage is yours. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here. Um, I started coming to Greece before many of you were even a possibility, uh, which is very encouraging to me because uh, that I can stand here before you and um, suggest that there's never been a more exciting moment to be a journalist and to be reporting the news. Now, it's not easy. Nothing worth doing is easy. Um, but it's enormously uh, important. Um, which is why I wanted to be here and why I thought it was appropriate to title this presentation to this wonderful organization, um, Signals in the Noise. Now, going all the way back to the beginning of Bloomberg News, which is almost 30 years ago, we had a, an expression that we shared with each other uh, to remind ourselves what it is we need to do every day to report the news. And the expression we shared then, and we still, I think, use it now, is show, don't tell. Show, don't tell. And so I have to live by that mantra today and in everything I do. And so this talk today is, here's hoping, all about showing less about telling. And maybe as a result of showing, uh, what we come out of this with is more credible uh, and uh, more meaningful. So I thought it was appropriate to start with the biggest picture, where I come from. Um, and where I come from is uh, the United States. And I want to take you back to uh, 2016, which, as you all know, now was a momentous year. Um, just as a reminder, it was the year that uh, surprised everyone with something called Brexit. And remember, the people in Britain, Great Britain, we're all excited about what they thought was going to be Grexit, which never happened, of course. Uh, and we'll get to that, by the way, before uh, our time is done here. Uh, but it started with Brexit. And then, of course, uh, something very momentous happened, um, an election in 2016 uh, in the US. Um, and Donald Trump was, was, was uh, elected president. I hesitate to use the word elected because actually his opponent, Hillary Clinton, got almost three million more votes. Uh, and if, this were, if we were a parliamentary uh, democracy in the US, uh, he would not be uh, the president. But that's a whole other issue. I just want to take you back to that year, 2016. And by way of reference, the last time I was here in Athens, uh, happened to be 2013, and it was not a very pleasant year. As many of you can recall that year. Um, the streets outside this window were not 
calm, um, just the opposite. Um, I actually have a piece of, uh, I think it's marble actually, that was thrown through our window, not too far from here, um, around that time. But anyway, 2016 in the US um, had a presidential election underway. And at the beginning of that year, it became clear that the race, uh, the political race, was going to be between Donald Trump. And we were waiting to see what the outcome would be in the Democratic primary, Hillary Clinton and uh, Bernie Sanders. There was, among all three candidates, an acknowledgement that somehow the economy wasn't working effectively. The US economy wasn't, wasn't working. But there was one fact that all three candidates omitted, and one fact that every news organization also admitted, omitted, and, and that was this. The US economy at the end of 2015 was in a, a very different place than probably anywhere else in the world. And that's because in the developed world, which includes the G7, many of the G20 countries, Europe, there was only one economy in 2016, the beginning of 2016, just one economy in the world that had record gross domestic product. Record gross domestic product. What does that mean? That means there was only one economy in the world that was growing and had grown so much that in the aftermath of the financial crisis and the greatest recession since the Great Depression, there was one economy that not only had rebounded out of that disaster, but was growing faster than it had at any time in the previous decade. And that economy was the US. Now, why is that important? It's a presidential election. And whether you turn to the New York Times, the Washington Post, or Reuters, or Bloomberg, or ABC or NBC, nightly news, morning news, real-time news, Twitter, not a single narrative, not a single broadcast shared with its readership, its listenership, its viewership, the reality that one economy was growing so fast that its gross domestic product was at an all-time high. And that's this green line right here. Everyone else, everyone else in the developed world was still behind where they were before the financial crisis of 2008. Not a single, not Germany, not Japan, not the EU collectively, not Greece, none of these economies had recovered to the point where they had record growth. Now, why is that important? Regardless of your ideology, regardless of your political party, every politician wants growth. Every politician wants growth because growth creates jobs. Growth creates personal income. Growth creates personal spending. And in the biggest economy of, the all, of them all, in the most important economy in the world, the most important signal, the most important fact, record growth, was missing in everybody's narrative. Now, we know what happened 
in 2016. We know that the story every day was a story of a problem economy, a failed economy, if you were Bernie Sanders campaigning, everything was going wrong. If you were Donald Trump campaigning, everything was going wrong in the US. And if you were Hillary Clinton, you didn't want to remind people who were less fortunate than you that things actually were going pretty well. And the person who could have taken credit for that was leaving office anyway, President Obama. So, the candidates really didn't spend any time talking about this record growth in 2016 in the biggest economy in the world, which happened to be the biggest story really in the world because that's the tide that lifts all boats. And that was the signal in the noise in 2016. What was behind that signal? What was behind that growth? Here in Athens, You've got an election coming soon. And everyone is talking about, doesn't matter which party, investment. We need investment. The more investment we have, the more growth we will have. And it doesn't matter whether you're on the left or the right. Everybody agrees it's all about investment. So what was driving that record growth of 2016 in the US. Something called research and development. Research and development. At the end of 2008, if you looked at the 500 largest companies in the world, publicly traded companies in the world, only two of the 10 largest of those companies in 2008, which was the depth, if you will, of the recession. It was really the last quarter of 2008 and the first two of 2009, where the US lost, lost record GDP contraction. At that time, there were only two of these big companies, the 10 largest companies in the world that spent 10%, 10% of their revenue, their sales, in what we call R&D, research and development. Microsoft and Johnson & Johnson. You probably know these companies, Microsoft for sure. Johnson & Johnson, you must know, you just have to open your medicine cabinet and there's something there from Johnson & Johnson. Why is that important? If we put it on fast forward and come to the present, Microsoft and Johnson Johnson are still in the top 10. It's funny that there's a reason, there's a cause. They kept investing. They kept investing in the future. And that's where growth comes from. Companies that invest in the future are usually the companies that make a difference and not only survive but prosper. So now I want to turn to one company in particular that spends an enormous amount on R&D, otherwise known as investment. That's a company you're also very familiar with. It's called Amazon. But let's go back in time and remember what is Amazon? Where did it come from? And what makes Amazon, Amazon? The company went public in 1997, which is a couple years after I started showing up in Athens for Bloomberg News. It was at that time an online bookstore. And it had a market capitalization of half a billion dollars. At the time, if you were reporting about that market, books, a typical quote was that Amazon getting into the online business of books against two entrenched 
giants in the U.S. One, Barnes and Noble, another called Borders, and the comments were Amazon doesn't have enough muscle to compete with these two entrenched giants. But it took less than a year from when Amazon went public to when its market cap exceeded both Barnes & Noble and Borders, which at the time was about $2.6 billion. And the firm, Amazon, of course, was selling more than books soon enough, was selling everything. And its market capitalization would exceed the world's largest retailer, Walmart, $220 billion by 2015. Walmart is still, by the way, number one in terms of annual sales. That's about $505 billion. But Amazon is now at $193 billion in total sales. Um, but what was going on you know, in the past 15 years? Amazon, of course, became the everything store, selling everything. Why not? If you can sell books online, why can't you sell everything online? And if you can sell everything online, you are making it more efficient for your consumer, wherever your consumer is, to buy anything. And in the process of doing so, you're not just a retailer, you're also a logistics company. You're also a software company. In fact, you're many companies rolled into one. That was Amazon. And it, Amazon wasn't just thinking about one thing in particular. It was thinking about many things all the time. A day didn't stop where Amazon didn't consider something else. Maybe 20 other, if you will, projects at any given time on the assumption that one of them, one of them, and all it would take would be one, could turn out to be a breakthrough in its business. And that's what investment is all about. That's what R&D is all about. It took a long time for my profession, your profession, to figure out what Amazon was about. Why? Because by conventional standards, from quarter to quarter, it didn't make any money. It didn't have any profit. We all measure success by P&L. That's the way to do it. But Amazon was measuring its success by this white line called total sales. The more sales, the more opportunity, because it's all about growth. Remember, that's the important word. It's all about growth. That's the most important signal. Where do you see growth? That's what everybody wants, whether it's an investor, whether it's a politician, whether it's the people outside this window, everybody wants growth, and this is what Amazon was about. It was totally about growth. It wasn't about profit and loss. It was about one thing, which is how do we get more and more customers? So today, Amazon is competing with Netflix in video streaming, and even though Netflix has a market capitalization that's grown 10 times in the past five years, it's still smaller than a fifth of Amazon. Um, Amazon is competing with the United Parcel Service, delivering packages every day. It's in the healthcare business. It's even in finance. Now, where's that left Amazon? The current market capitalization of Amazon is now $808 billion. It actually, last year, got to be more than a trillion dollars. Um, but the point here is Amazon is still, it's the orange line, is still the size of six companies combined in different industries. Barnes & Noble, Walmart, IBM, Oracle, Netflix, and UPS. Those are all different industries, and one company is in every one of them because it's thinking about the future. It's thinking about investment, and it's thinking about growth. That's a very big signal. 
This, the company spends eight to ten years to research new products. So that's an example of why they're always thinking ahead. Now, what's their end market? It's something like 16% of the global gross domestic product, including China. And if we were to try to put that in context, where is Amazon today? It's maybe on the third floor of the Empire State Building. That's the gap that's in front of it for opportunity. What else is Amazon doing? Hiring a lot of people. As of September 2018, 613,000 jobs have been created. 613,000 jobs have been created since it went public in 1997. So what is the meaning of that? Um, you know, companies disclose different sets of information at different times, but if we looked at Walmart, Han Hai, Volkswagen, and the Compass Group, those are the only companies in the world that have more employees than Amazon. That's how big Amazon is. But going back to 1997, as I said, the prospectus from the initial sale of shares, May 14th, 1997, said the online bookseller may never make any money and that its operating costs were greater than Barnes & Noble and Borders Group. And by the way, in the first month of trading, the shares declined 19%. And as I said, uh, one of our um, analysts at the time, a fellow by the name of Steve Zenker, said to us in May 1997, I just don't see how they're going to have the muscle to pull this off. That was 1997. Okay, let's put it on fast forward. Amazon isn't the only example of this. And Amazon in its early years was as controversial with news people, especially in the United States, as any company could be. Because most of us, because it didn't have a P&L, well it had L, it didn't have P, um, didn't believe it. Because um, we were perhaps missing the signal. So is there perhaps another example like Amazon right now where most of us don't believe it? Yeah. It's a car company. Maybe it's more than that. It's called Tesla. And most of us write about its CEO. He was the chairman until he got into trouble with the SEC and they said you can't do that anymore because you Twitter too much and uh, smoke too much weed. So uh, he's still the CEO. But he's the CEO of the only company in the world that has managed to convince all the other companies, there are 44 automobile companies in the world, convince them that the future is zero emission. Everybody talks about climate change, but until 2010, when Tesla introduced its vehicle, the Model S, it had already made a sports car called the Roadster that was all EV. But until 2010, not a company in the world that sells automobiles said the future is zero emission. If you turn on your favorite news source today, everybody's talking about it now, one way or the other. And now they're even talking about Tesla killers from everywhere. The people who make uh, the carbon product the internal combustion engine, and that's everybody else, now says, paying lip service to Tesla, um, you know, we're going to do that too. We're going to do that too. But what did Tesla do? And why is Tesla 
interesting in the context of Amazon? Well, just like Amazon, Tesla, no profit. Lots of loss, no profit. If you went to Bloomberg News in um, the past year or so, Tesla's perceived failings include burning through cash, that phrase, burning through cash. It was reported 135 times by Bloomberg News in, since 2013. There were more short sellers, those are the people who don't believe anything, that they're going to they're gonna borrow money to bet against you. That's how convinced that you're a failure. Um, there were more short sellers for Tesla than 499 companies in the Standard & Poor's 500 index. Everybody talked about management turnover, this temperamental leader. Um, last November, right about the, the time of our national Thanksgiving holiday, um, the Washington Post called Elon Musk a double turkey. And that's because we usually eat turkey on Thanksgiving. Um, and as I mentioned, the SEC uh, is still battling him over his, his tweets. But a funny thing happened since 2010, and that, that's when Tesla went public. Um, with all of that noise, burning through cash, no profit, lots of loss, um, the Tesla shares produced 10 times their initial value to investors, 10 times. So if you bought Tesla shares in 2010, even with all that noise I just described, you were 10 times wealthier. That's growth. None of the 50 largest automakers can beat the performance of Tesla in that period. None of them. None of them have anything close to that performance in valuation. Now you might ask, why? How is this possible? How is it possible that this company, the only company that's making a product going entirely against the industry worldwide could have so much confidence from its shareholders when there's no profit and based on everything you read, they're doing everything they could possibly do that's wrong, including their idiosyncratic, dare I say, eccentric founder leader, Elon Musk. But there is a signal here, a very important signal. It's called growth. That word will keep coming back again and again today, this afternoon. Growth, which is what everybody cares about. And what is this red line here? This is the growth of Tesla sales, of people in the US, people in Europe, people in the Pacific Rim, people in Asia, people everywhere in the world deciding to invest in the future and buy zero emission vehicles because they can, because they can. And this line here, this red line, is that growth. Um, Tesla's most quarterly revenue of, of $6.8 billion is more than 200 times its quarterly sales during the IPO year. Um, the rest of the car industry is right here. That's their growth, which is no growth. See this flat line here? Looks like somebody had a heart attack, doesn't it? Um, that's the rest of the, auto that's the world automobile industry. So what got 
in the face of all this journalism about Tesla doing things wrong, is this one signal of Tesla growing. Growing because people like the product. And, and they like the product so much that investors said if they like the product so much, no matter what anybody says, on nightly news, morning news, anybody's news, that's the signal for me. That's the signal and the noise. Okay. We're in Greece now. Favorite destination for me. Should be a favorite destination for the world, and I like to think it is, by the way. Uh, even if recent news over the past decade hasn't been as favorable as it might have been or should be. But there is some good news. Actually, there's some news, whether you like, call it good or not. It's news. It's big news. Last month, as I was looking at my Bloomberg terminal with some of my colleagues, I saw an item that said that Greece, country of 10 million people, sold some bonds. The first 10-year bonds Greece has sold in nine years. And of course, that would get my attention. Um, and by the way, it got the attention of somebody who's indispensable to me and to Bloomberg, who was kind enough to share all these wonderful data sets. Shin Pei, my colleague, who's right over here. So, uh, you know, I just want you to know that um, this, you know, I'm not the Wizard of Oz here. Uh, there really is uh, something very intelligent behind the curtain. Um, and, uh, we can't be with you today unless we're showing you exactly what, what we see and why we see it. So we're looking at this. It's sort of a bulletin from our Athens Bureau um, that says Greece is selling this debt. And um, what caught our attention was a number of things. The price of these securities, which are due in 2029, was very high. How high? They originally priced to yield 3.9%. Now, just put that in perspective. The price, this is 2019, March. The price of 10-year bonds, Greece, priced to yield 3.9%. And by the way, that was a lot better than the initial target of 4.13%. But why was this amazing news? I mean, like, incredible news. Incredible news. Why? Because if you go back to that dark year of 2013, when I was here last, and even the year before it, 2012, the yield on very similar bonds due in 10 years was 30%. 30%. 30 percent. 30 percent. 3 0. And now, March, day one, it's 3.9. But it changes. Those bonds go up in price for seven consecutive days. Those bonds from Greece go up every single day for the next seven days to the extent that the investors who wanted those bonds, it was 4.7 times the issue size. Okay, that's how much demand there was. There was so much demand that the yield on this Greek debt it's the lowest in 13 years. The yield on this Greek debt was the lowest in 13 years. There were some outstanding Greek bonds, and they fell to 3.4% April 10th. So it got even better. By the way, this was 2012. This is where we are today. 
Uh, sorry, this was the financial crisis. No, no, this is 2012. This is when it was 30 percent. 2015 today. So take a step back. What is that signal telling us? Why is this such an important signal? Because there's been a lot of noise about Greece. A lot. Um, as I said here, the yield was 18% in 2015. The yield was 30% in 2012. Let's go back to uh, 2015. It's just a few years ago. And you may recall the first six months, seven months of 2015. Here and everywhere else in the world, everyone's front page was Greece. Everyone's front page. Everybody was talking about Greece. A new government had been elected the previous November, assumed power in January. The new government said, we don't like this austerity that's being imposed upon us by Europe, the European Union. And we want to do something about it. And we don't like it, and we've had enough. And we're going to repudiate the previous government here. And that was the narrative coming into 2015. And everybody is reporting it. Because if you didn't look at this too carefully, you might think Greece was poised to leave the euro and even default. Because this new government, if you didn't pay too close attention, was suggesting that it was not going to cooperate. And that was the storyline. And it got louder whether you were reading the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times or Bloomberg or the Washington Post or the New York Times or BBC or NBC or ABC. It got louder and louder. When we interviewed Alan Greenspan, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve, arguably the most important financial institution in the world because it sets interest rates for everybody because the dollar is the reserve currency, he said, it's only a matter of time before Greece leaves the euro and defaults. He said that. Smart guy. Another smart person, George Soros, totally different from Alan Greenspan, said to us a month later, Greece is going down the drain. Of course, these are important people. And what they said got reported again and again and again. There was some anxiety. There was some anxiety. The yield did creep up to almost 19% by July of 2015, but that was still below the high 2012, April, when Greek debt was yielding 30%. That was the, that was, we now can see here, the worst moment of the crisis. 2012, April. Um, why is this such an important signal? Well, this, the smartest people in the world, as it turns out, were paying very close attention to Greece and have been for some time now. Literally since 2012. So at least seven years. Smartest people in the world. They're in Canada, they're in France, they're in Belgium, they're in Austria, they're in the US, right near where I live, Newark, New Jersey. And what were they doing since 2012, and especially since 2015? They were buying every Greek bond they could get their hands on. 
And the reason why they were doing it is because they saw a signal, an overwhelming signal. In all the noise about Greece, Greece and failure, economic failure, they saw a signal, which is exactly the opposite of the noise. And what did they see? They saw a government, didn't matter which government, whether it was the government of Samaras, whether it was the government that followed him, the current government, and each of those governments shared the same thing. What was that thing that they shared? If you went back over the past 10 years and looked at every public opinion poll in Greece and tried to find one poll that said the people of Greece want to return to drachmas. You won't find that poll because it doesn't exist. Not once in the past 10 years, even when things were their most painful, even when one government was doing the unthinkable and firing government employees, did the people of Greece say, we want to return to drachma. So investors around the world looked at that and said, they're not going to leave the euro because they don't have a preference for drachma. And if they're not going to leave the euro, they're not going to default. And if they're not going to default, these bonds are the best investment in the world. In fact, they were in 2015. And since 2015, if you bought Greek bonds, you made a total return of 231%. That's better than any stock market. It's better than any commodity market, better than any art market. It's the best investment going, Greek bonds. And if you looked around the world, by contrast, any sovereign debt market, Germany, France, the US, nothing comparable. Took the whole global bond market at that time, it was 9.6% in the entire period from 15 to present. Um, even the riskiest securities, high yield bonds, so-called junk bonds, 22%. So Greece was your winner. Um, and as I mentioned before, who are these people who are buying? Well, Prudential Financial Inc., Newark, New Jersey. They manage a lot of money for pensions. They manage a lot of money for pensions. They were buying Greek bonds. Who else was buying Greek bonds? Carmignac Gestion in Paris, another big buyer of Greek bonds. Sort of everywhere you looked, there was somebody who was interested in Greece. Okay, so why did they do this? They did it for the same reason that people bought Amazon. They did it for the same reason that people bought into Tesla. Because even though something really horrendous by conventional economic arithmetic was happening, just like P&L, Greece's debt to GDP went from 82% in 2006 to 181.9%. That's, you know, scary. It's the highest since we've been compiling the data in 2003. And among, you know, 25 developed economies, Greece has the second highest debt to GDP ratio. Um, Japan is the highest, 236%. But there's another signal that kind of offsets that signal. When you look at the resolution of the debt crisis in Greece, and what happened? What happened in 2015? What was the deal? Why did the bond market, of all things, keep rallying? Why did investors get more and more confident about Greece, in particular, 
since 2015. And stay confident right to this moment. Well, one reason is that deal with Europe, with those awful people in Europe who are dictating terms and everything. Actually, the terms that were imposed on Greece, the big one was all that debt has an average weighted maturity of more than a quarter century, 26 years. That means, you know, put yourself in the position of Greece. You have all this debt, but you don't have to pay it back for a quarter of a century. Now, you have a lot of time to do a lot of things, but you don't have to worry about paying back the principal on your loan for 26 years. Now, why is that so significant? Spain and Italy have only seven years, by contrast. Portugal has ten. So Greece, among the so-called casualties of the financial crisis and the depression that followed here, came out of it financially with amazingly good terms from its friends, its friends in the EU. And that's why these governments are still doing business in the EU. That's why Greece still very much is part of the EU. And the place that probably created the most noise about Brexit, which was the UK, is now Brexit. And very few people saw that coming. So, what happened? What's happening? You know, since the beginning of the century, nobody is growing, nobody is growing as fast as they were in the early years, 2000. The white line you see in front of you is Greece, however. And it went from the worst, which again was, this is 2011, 2012, went from being the worst to having the fastest rebound, the biggest rebound of any country. In other words, coming out of its slump, it's growing faster, more faster, more better faster than anybody else in Europe. Um, and we're looking at Germany, we're looking at France, and we're looking at the entire Eurozone. So precisely at the time, it's now 2015, when people are saying Greece is unhinged and about to blow up, it was actually well on its way to a recovery. What kind of recovery? To the extent that this year, the year that Greece sold these 10-year bonds that have the lowest interest rate in a decade, Greece is now number 10 among all the countries growing in the EU, in the Eurozone. Number 10. There are a lot of countries, as you well know but it's number 10. So it's no longer in last place, or second to last place, or third to last place. It's actually outperforming most of the countries in the EU. And if you look at what economists say, because they say a lot, over this year and the next year, it's going to outperform Germany. It's going to outperform France in terms of growth and it's going to outperform Austria in terms of growth. So, far from being a basket case, Greece is actually, right now, doing better than these other countries. It's not to say life is wonderful or a bowl of cherries, it's just to say that when you look at the world in the context of relative value, and that's the key thing here for any news person, What's the relative value? That's when you're going to most likely find the signals in the noise. Um, 
by the way, the uh, budget deficit to GDP, something that people would pay attention to, um, it rose as high as 15.1% in 2009. Now it's a surplus. The budget deficit is a surplus. And it was the first surplus since 1995, and that's when we started compiling this data. And the surplus to GDP for Greece widened to 0.8% 2017. And according to 11 economists at Bloomberg, who we survey, the surplus is going to continue for the next three years. Um, that unemployment rate, which was so scary, which was at 28 plus percent, well, 27.7 to be precise, 2013. It's now back to 18, which is not comfortable, but it's on its way to 16 and a half. And if the economy keeps growing, this is the trend line. So, you know, most of the vital signs have come back. Um, and for those people who were looking at those turning points in vital signs, they, of course, have done very well, betting on Greece, uh, believing in Greece. What's another, if you like, reality check on where we are today? That probably isn't getting a lot of attention. The stock market. There are 60 stocks in the Athens Stock Exchange General Index. So far this year, those 60 stocks have produced a return, income appreciation, 21%. That's the best in the world. That's the best stock market in the world. Sorry. It's the second best, excuse me. It's the second best in the world, but close enough. There are 94 markets in the world. Greece is number two. Um, now, there are 569 banks in the world in, you know, with a minimum market capitalization of a billion dollars. Greek banks, banks in Greece, produced 35% this year. That's beating the banks in every other country. The banks, the Greek banks, so far this year, are outperforming banks anywhere else in the world. Not only that, they're trading, these banks in Greece are trading at their lowest, what we call price to book measure. What does that mean? It means that they're still considered cheap. So you've already made all this money buying Greek bank stocks, but you're poised to make even more money if you hold them a little while longer because their relative value is so attractive compared to other banks. It's not to say, again, things are wonderful. Of these banks, you know what they have? They have the highest ratio of non-performing Assets to total loans, you know, you usually call that bad debt, bad loans. Not a surprise coming out of um, the depression that occurred after the financial crisis. Um, but even that measure has improved somewhat. Um, used to be as high as 42% 2017, it's now 39%. Um, it looks like it's if the growth continues, that ratio will come down, which is why people like the banks, because they see the biggest opportunity, biggest opportunity for growth. <laughs> growth, that's the key word. They see the biggest opportunity for growth. You know, the last thing about Greece that's interesting is uncertainty. Everybody hates uncertainty. CEOs hate uncertainty, investors hate uncertainty. How do you look at uncertainty? What is uncertainty? Uncertainty in, in a stock market or a bond market or any market is otherwise called volatility, when the values fluctuate dramatically, incessantly, up and down. So you think there's no rhyme or reason, and it's crazy 
because it's up and down all the time. And so you can't be sure of what you're buying or selling even because there's so much volatility, so many fluctuations. So what's happened here in Greece in the stock market? This is a white line measuring volatility. And this is, this orange line is relative to the rest of the world. And as you can see, the volatility, the fluctuations have collapsed to basically nothing. They've gone from this gap here where there was enormous uncertainty to practically nothing. And that's a measure of confidence that people around the world looking at the stock market in Greece say, compared to everybody else, I don't have as much to worry about, if anything to worry about. And that is the story of Greece right now. One final thought before I allow you to take apart everything I just said is Brexit. And I, I think it's appropriate to share the experience of the UK because it wasn't too long ago when all of these smart people, many of whom lived and breathed in London, were opining on Greece, right? And telling the Greeks everything they thought was wrong with Greece, okay? And then along comes this vote, Brexit. And the British people decided they were going to leave the EU, not Greece. They were going to leave the EU. They haven't left yet, as you know. They've been spending the past, you know, almost three years trying to figure out <laughs> how to do that. And the more they think about it, the more painful it gets. Just how painful is it? Just how damaging is it to Britain that it just voted? It hasn't done it yet? Well, the first thing is the pound. And since the pound is no longer the world's reserve currency, when the pound fluctuates, it matters a great deal to everybody, especially to the central bank, because losing 10% on your currency, and by the way, that happened literally in seconds, and it hasn't been recovered in three years is that the pound went from 140 to 130 as soon as people realized Brexit was the outcome. But something else has happened since then, um, and that is the GDP growth for Britain has plunged, and it's now underperforming the 20-year average for Great Britain. And they haven't even left yet, and they're already in a bad place economically just because of that decision to leave the Euro economy, the Eurozone. That's enough for now. Thank you very much. Sure. Hello, my name is uh, Panos Papoulias and I work for the Stavros Achos Foundation. Uh, I think your presentation was a very vivid uh, example of how investigative journalism can, in the case of e economic data and, and, and data digging, um, can give rise to insights that are not apparent to the eye. Do you think the values and the training that um, allow for such insights in economic journalism are similar to the values in training that one might have in, a journalist might have in covering issues of a more social nature or a you know, different type of journalism? So I love the question because it says, what I showed, what we showed today, um, is it something that's really applicable to the entire profession of journalism um, everywhere? And not just for people like me, um, at Bloomberg? And the answer, I would say, is emphatically yes. And the reason why I say that is, you know, when I started my career as a newspaper man, and it was as a newspaper man, you know, it was before we said things like digital and online, you know, those words didn't exist. And in fact, before 
I was even using an electric typewriter. I was using a manual typewriter. And most people in this room don't even know what a manual typewriter is. Um, but the purpose of me saying that is when I started my career, I had no access to data to speak of. In other words, I had no access to this enormous reservoir of facts, which is data. So if I wanted to know something beyond what somebody told me, you know, because they would tell me things and I would write it down in a notebook and then I would share what was said and what I saw said and done in my reporting, it was very um, limited, to say the least, what I did back then. I mean, you know, I worked very hard and everything, but it was still very limited because it was confined to what I saw and what I heard, sights and sounds. And that is pretty much what journalism has been for centuries. Today, in the 21st century, we all have access to unlimited data. Now, as we well know, we're also dealing with this giant clash between information and misinformation. And we have to figure out how to separate the two and find the information. But we can do that. We're smart enough. We're persistent enough. We're courageous enough. We can find, we can find the signals and the noise. And the signals and the noise is the data, all kinds of data that exists everywhere that is instantly a reality check on whatever assumptions we're encountering. And as long as we're disciplined enough to search the data, find the data, be able to ask the right questions, what we can produce in our reporting is so much more comprehensive and definitive than anything that was possible you know, when I started my career even as a reporter at the Wall Street Journal, which I thought was the, you know, the pinnacle of journalism in 1980 when you know, I was making my way, uh, and in 1982 when I started in London as a reporter, and you know, I thought I was you know, at the top. And it doesn't begin, doesn't begin to come close to what we can, all of us can do today as journalists because of the data that is at our disposal. We just know how to use it, and, and believe me, that's where we need to go if we want to find the signals in all the noise. Because it's real easy for any of us to report what people say, right? And some people say a lot all the time, right? And, and almost all of what they say is not true all the time. So our job is, is to, in the face of all that noise, find these signals. And the signals is the data. The data is accessible. Yes, a lot of it's available on Bloomberg. We wouldn't be in business if it wasn't, but it's also available many other places. So yeah, the answer to your question is yeah. In the back, I see a hand. Hi, my name's Omaira Gill. I'm a business reporter from Acropolis. Um, it was very interesting, the numbers which you showed, which compare how Greece has been growing to other economies in the world. Um, for me, it was very interesting personally because I deal with these numbers, but just in the context of Greece, so the contrast was quite impressive. I'm just wondering, um, do these numbers take into account the low baselines which Greece is starting from, considering we lost so much GDP, uh, nearly 27%, and do investors take that into account when they're seeing this very impressive growth in Greece? Yeah, what I showed you is what is available to everybody. Um, and. I think what's significant about this data, as you just referenced, is that in order to understand it, in order to appreciate it and to find the meaning in it, um, looking at Greece just in the context of Greece is very limiting. Looking at Greece in the context of the entire Eurozone is much more meaningful. How is Greece performing relative to other countries? Um, and if Greece is outperforming right now those other countries today and yesterday and tomorrow, um, that's a trend. And that's what 
investors actually pay attention to and economists pay attention we all pay attention to what's the trend and the trend is right now and has been actually not just for months but for several years now that Greece has been doing better relatively speaking better albeit from you know its worst recession in modern times but it's doing better now than any of these other countries that we compared it to um, and that is what gets people excited you know because investors when they just like with Amazon and Tesla um, or even Microsoft or Johnson & Johnson what they get excited about is where is the growth where is the growth where is the growth coming from how is the growth created and it probably is encouraging to some of those people when they when they talk to politicians right now in Greece in every party the one thing everyone says in every party is we need more investment we want more investment and that's a good sign Hello. Hi. Um, I'll make the question in uh, Greek, so you must have it translate. Μιλάμε για τις επενδύσεις. Υπάρχει ένα ζήτημα όμω εδώ στην Ελλάδα. Λένε ακριβώ ότι δεν μπορούν να γίνουν επενδύσεις αν δεν μειωθεί η φορολογία. Ε, το ερώτημα λοιπόν είναι ότι θα πρέπει να στραφούμε προς τις επενδύσεις ή θα πρέπει να ε, υπάρξει μια ανάπτυξη στην παραγωγική βάση της χώρας και ακολούθως να δούμε το μοντέλο των επενδύσεων διότι σε διαφορετική περίπτωση ενδέχεται επιχειρηματικοί όμιλοι να στραγγαλίσουν ουσιαστικά ε, ενδέχεται να στραγγαλίσουν ουσιαστικά τις ε, μικρές επιχειρήσεις δεν ξέρω τώρα αν ακούσατε όλη την ερώτηση να Whether, so on the on the issue of investment, whether um, we should start, we should be uh, head first into the investment, or take care of the um, the structural reforms first, like and uh, um, lowering taxes for one, uh, and whether one or the other might mean that bigger corporations might strangle smaller, uh, you know the. Um, SMEs, etc., and whether it's the right approach to start with investment. Okay, thank you for your question. Um, it's way above my pay grade to suggest what the policy should be here. That's, um, for me, that's, you know, beyond my skill set, um, knowledge, experience. What I can say is this, what I can say is this about your question. Um, one of the biggest signals in all this wasn't just about Greece at all. It was Greece by deciding, not deciding, Greece by never wavering, not once, from its commitment to the Euro and Europe, to the Eurozone was doing something profound that is bigger than Greece itself. Because, you know, these people that I mentioned before, Alan Greenspan, you know, they've been saying the euro wasn't going to be around. They've been saying it for 20 years. They've been saying the euro is not going to be around. So that a country of 10 million people never once said we're, we're getting out, and are still here, and the euro is still here, and for all of its flaws, which we diagnose every day, God knows, the European community, the eurozone, the EU economy has gone from something very little to something gigantic. In fact, it's the biggest economic block 
in the world. The Eurozone is the biggest trading economic bloc in the world. Now, it's got lots of disparities, dichotomies, and everything else, Greece being one of them. But what's profound about the crisis is that amid all of the constant doubt about Europe and the Euro, and 28 countries saying we want to be part of something that's bigger than us, that's better for us, that's better for everybody, and there are more benefits to that. And by the way, I'll take you back to when I first came to Greece, of course, it was a drachma economy. And Athens was nowhere near as prosperous when I started coming back in the 80s, 1980s, as it is today. I know that's hard to believe for many of you, but it, it was a totally different country. Today, and by the way, it didn't quite feel like it was Europe the way the UK felt like Europe, France felt like Europe, Germany felt like Europe. Greece did not feel like that. It didn't look like that. Today, it's Europe. It's Greece, but it's also Europe. And there's no mistaking that. And that's a very big thing. That's a very powerful thing. And, you know, whether the, whether the recipe for growth is some form of cutting taxes or greater investment or whatever, whatever the mix is, it's going to be a mix of something. As long as Greece is part of Europe, it's going to benefit from being part of Europe. It's going to help Greece, which is why the Greek people said, we're not leaving. No, no matter how bad this austerity feels and is, we're not leaving because this is better than where we were in the 1980s when we were on drachmas. Thank you for taking a second question. Um, you were very elaborate on how you described you know, the, the first years of how you worked as a journalist and how things have progressed. And that was a, a, a testimony to the important job that journalists do nowadays. And it was clear from your presentation that a lot of hard work needs to go into you know, distilling the, you know, the, the important information that will give you and to, to a journalist and to the readers of the journalist the, the correct idea and view about the situation. I mean, your example of the U.S. economy during the Obama years was, was, very, was, was, was very specific. I'd like to ask a question about the readers. I mean, you know, journalists write always for someone and for something, and the readers also face the same challenge and opportunity. There is ma many more stories out there to read. Um, they get bombarded with with uh, information in the form of different news items and you know this has created a trend in trying to help the readers you know uh, distill between uh, fake news and real news it seems that being a, a journalist that filters out the noise is very hard work how hopeful can one be about movements or initiatives that try to educate or train the reader to distill between fake news and, and thoroughly researched news, and is, there, is this a chimera? Is it something that we shouldn't be even looking at? Because it obviously takes a lot of hard work. So I love the question because, you know, what we're meant to do as journalists is not altogether different than the empirical method in science, you know. You replicate your experiment enough, the results at least, and you do it over and over again, and you finally conclude it's not just a theory, it's a fact, because we've been able to replicate the same experiment multiple times. And with our ability to discern data now in an unlimited way, we are closer to science than ever before as journalists because we're doing something similar. 
We're looking at what we see around us, what we hear around us, and we're able to test again and again whether what we see and hear is in fact replicate. And I'll give you an example. So, knowing what we know, vaccines work. Vaccinations work. Okay? We know that. If we have the vaccines, we can prevent measles. But there's a whole group of people where I come from who believe, you know, vaccines are bad. Now, the science proves overwhelmingly that vaccines are good for you and you don't have to get measles if you get a vaccine. But there are people out there who are going to insist, and that's the fake news part, that no, 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 I'm not going to do that. And then they get the measles. So uh, fortunately, the trial and error part is painful. But I do believe that in journalism, more so than ever before, we can be much more a part of what science is doing for the world. You know, and science is doing a great deal for the world. It's helping us live longer, better, healthier lives, um, and journalism is very much a part of that. You know, talk about making the world a better place. Better informed citizenry, you know, is a better informed, a better world if the citizenry is better informed. And so it, it works very much together with science. Science gives me a lot of confidence um, because that's knowledge, and knowledge is something that we can all benefit from, and that's our job as journalists, is to make people better informed so they can make better choices about their lives and help people. And here's hoping do more creative things and not harm anybody in the bargain. And that's what it's all about. I guess that's, that's it for me. Thank you very much.